Welcome everybody. Today's lecture is China's sphere of influence, which is Japan, Korea, and Vietnam. This coincides with chapter 13 in your red and black book uh, that you are not reading. You are just going to watch the lecture and download the PowerPoint. First, let's talk about China's influence. China served as a model of development, and it spread to Japan in the 5th and 6th century BCE. And here's Japan. It spread to Vietnam and Korea in the last centuries BCE. Here are the Koreas, and here is Vietnam. Chinese culture blended with local culture, and Buddhism played a key role in transmitting Chinese culture. They were all linked to China, and in doing so, they were further isolated from the rest of the world. Let's notice the size of China, how it kind of serves as a barrier to this area of the world. Let's take a look at Japan's um, geography. If you notice that Japan is in, broken into islands, there's four islands and hundreds of small islands. Uh, this first big island appears Hokkaido. Uh, the second, uh, and which is the largest main island, is Honshu. And then towards the bottom you have Shikoku and Kyushu. Um, if you look over to the left, uh, this is Japanese writing. We call it kanji. Uh, this is Japanese writing for uh, the word Japan, ni hon. Moving on, we will talk about Japan's imperial age. First, let's define the word imperial. Imperial means of or relating to an empire. Um, so Chinese influence peaked in Japan from the 7th to the 8th century. Um, they set up, a, modeled after the Chinese style of bureaucracy, army, etiquette, etiquette is like manners, and art. There are two civilized centers, uh, Naro and Heian. And there's also reform, um, the Taika reforms in 646 CE. Um, and these reforms entailed the Japanese government um, who was seeking to make Japan like China. And so under these reforms, they were copying most of China's uh, systems. Challenges during this time period. Um, traditional Japanese religious views, we call it Shinto, Shintoism. And so the Japanese were uh, having selective borrowing from the Chinese. Aristocrats who wanted to return to traditional values gained power, and so they were more likely to lean towards Shintoism rather than um, Confucianism. And Buddhist monasteries were forbidden in Haiyan, but they were built around the outside of Haiyan, gaining power. And so you have the government who's trying to uh, be more like China, based on Confucianism, um, challenged by uh, the rise of Buddhist um, aristocracy, who were trying to push their ideology of Buddhism, and so there is this power struggle occurring. This power struggle um, gets so intense that the emperor leaves Nara uh, to Haiyan, which is modern-day Kyoto. And if you look at the arrow, it shows you the shift from Nara to Haiyan. And as I mentioned a few minutes ago, the Buddhists gained power. Um, so the Buddhists would be against the, the rise of Chinese values in Japan. The empire is threatened by Buddhism, and this is why they move. And Haiyan is t only 28 miles from Nara. Um, in Haiyan, Buddhism, uh, Buddhist mon monasteries are forbidden. However, they're built on the outskirts, and they do wind up gaining power. So how did the Japanese live? Here's an image of court life in the Haiyan era. Um, their life was based on luxury, uh, aesthetics. Aesthetics are all things that are beautiful. Social status. Think of, of how people perceive each other. Modern day connection would be Facebook. Poetry, gossip, palaces, gardens. Uh, one of the uh, most famous literature uh, that came out of this time period from Japan is the Tale of Genji. And the Tale of Genji was written by Lady Murasaki, and she wrote about court life in Japan. And so this was a, a very high level of living. 
So uh, after a while, there's going to be a decline of the imperial power, and there's going to be a rise of the warrior elite. The Fujiwara family, who was most influential in the ninth century in Japan, um, gained large estates. Estates is large areas of land. And then they married into the ruling aristocracy, and so they were able to gain power in doing so. Elite families in provinces withheld land from aristocrats. Think of provinces as being in the rural areas. And they created local governments ruled by local lords. And these uh, formed into a sort of mini-states. Uh, Bushi were warriors, and samurai were mounted troops warriors who were effective and loyal to lords. So a samurai was a bushi, but a bushi was not a, a, always a samurai. Um, and everyone relayed, relied on the serfs for food. Serfs were bound to land. They were treated different than the samurai. There was a rigid class system, which means that it wasn't flexible at all. And so if you were a serf, you were probably going to stay a serf. And so the serfs would turn to Buddhism. And um, the upper class looked at Zen Buddhism, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And the lower class um, focused on uh, the Buddhism that's associated with salvation. And so now we move on to the dominance of these warriors, the Bushi and the Samurai. And so there's a lot of strife after the 12th century, which peaks in the 15th to 16th century until the Tokugawa Shogunate. There are issues between the Minamoto family and the Taira family. And in 1885, the Minamoto family destroys the Taira family. And the Minamoto family sets up a Bakufu, which is a military government. And what they do is they leave the emperor in Haiyan alone. But it is the Minamoto family and the samurai that have the real power. And this begins the feudal age in Japan. And so there is a declining influence of China. Uh, due to the decline of the imperial base, the upper class no longer is um, seeking Chinese goods because there has now been a shift to the warrior elite. Uh, Buddhism also becomes distinctively Japanese, and so it modifies, you know, the original uh, Buddhist tradition that had came from India through Jap uh, China and into Japan. Also, officials stop visiting China, and they stop paying uh, China tribute as well. Yoritomo uh, Minamoto becomes very suspicious of his family, and so he he uh, kills his entire family, and he begins the Kamakura Shogun. Shogun is a military uh, rule, and he's ruthless. He dies without a hair. Um, the Hojo family is able to take control, but they leave the Minamoto Shogun in place, and they continue to rule in the name of the emperor. Under the Ashikaga Shogunate in 1336 to 1573, uh, the Kamakura um, Shogun is overthrown, and the emperor is exiled. And so the results of this breakdown is that the emperor's weakened, the Bushi warlord powers grow, uh, the court aristocracy is weakened, so the samurai are given land in exchange for protection, and there is a decentralization of the government into 300 kingdoms. And the, this is the rise of the warrior, uh, warlord ruler called Daimo, which you could think of as a lord. Okay, we're at the end of Japan, so let's talk about military division and show, uh, social change as well. So there's castles from the 15th to 16th century. The peasant armies begin to replace the samurai, so you have the decline of the samurai. There's a lot of chaos and suffering. There's new tools, there's new crops, and there's also uh, the growth of profitable items such as silk, hemp, paper, dyes, and oil. There's new a new merchant class, and they set up guilds. Notice how much of this resembles um, medieval Europe. So, uh, you know, you need to be comparing and contrasting um, across uh, areas. Um, and if you were to look at um, oh, to the image on the right, you'll see the longbow. Um, and women were taught in merchant families um, to to learn how to sell items and the women in the warrior family learn how to ride horses and to use the longbow as well 
Um, under arts, you have the rise of Zen Buddhism. And so down here to the right is an image of a rock garden, which is symbolic of Zen Buddhism to focus on beauty and, and the aesthetics of the world. Um, also, the rise of pavilions, which is very famously known in Japan, tea ceremony. There's also a rise in the creation of a nationhood. And so this is uh, Japan becoming one, becoming one Japan. And there's economic and cultural growth during the warlord area, which prevented uh, barbarianism. And the daimo, which were the lords, improved administration and unified Japan. Okay, now we're moving to Korea. And so Korea was most impacted by China. However, it also created a separate, distinct identity. And so look at that map and make sure you know where uh, Korea is in relation to China. Notice how also how close it is to Japan. First, let's look at early Korea. So early Korea began with the Shoson Empire in the 4th century BCE. Um, it had a lot of farming, and, and it was captured by Han China and settled by the Chinese. It was broken into three kingdoms, Korgoyo, Pakshe, and Shia. Afterwards, this led to Sinification, which is the extensive adoption of Chinese culture. And so Korea was modeled uh, very similar to China. And Buddhism is linked to Korea and China, and the government is styled after China. And so that's why if you ever wonder uh, why Korean culture is so similar to China, this is the reason why. So there's a Tang alliance. Tang is reference to China. Um, within the three kingdoms, there's an internal warfare, which makes them weak. And Tang, Tang China is able to beat Paiche and Korgryo. Uh, and it made a deal with Xi in 668 and withdrew the Chinese army. And so Koreans are able to maintain their independence and political boundaries until the 20th century when Japan um, invades them. Um, and so Sinification, we had said, was um, the establishment of, of Chinese culture. And this is highly evident under the Kingdom of Xia from 668 to the late 19th century, as well as the Koryo Dynasty in 918 to 1392. They imitated the Tang Empire. They paid the Chinese tribute, uh, which guaranteed peace. Koreans received Chinese literature, dress, and um, goods, not gods, like it says. And Korea served as a channel between its neighbors. Okay, I have fixed the word goods. And uh, now let's look at the images. So you have a beautiful crown. Um, you have influence from China, as we said. And you also have the Korea dynasty. Okay, let's talk about the Korean elite. And so the Korean uh, elite lived in mansions and palaces. They had slaves. They studied in Chinese schools. They had birth privileges, and they favored Buddhism over Confucianism, and so the Chinese were not able to win over uh, Koreans under uh, the ideologies of religion. They did learn porcelain manufacturing from the Chinese, but all the imports coming in from China were only for the elites, and so the, the, the lower classes were not uh, exposed to it as much signification as the upper class, and all the lower classes worked for the elites. And so um, we're going to end with Korea, but remember the key point with Korea is how closely it copied China in the social system, in um, economics, in political systems, and uh, of course the proximity or the location of Korea to China and the influence of many of the dynasties over time. Okay, we're moving into our last um, area of Chinese influence, which is Vietnam. Vietnam was located along the Red River Valley in the BCE time period. And you can see how the, this is a Google Earth image. It looks red, the river. It's a rice-growing civilization, and it was highly developed uh, by the time the Chinese arrived. And so, uh, although China can have a lot of influence, it's not going to have as much as Korea. It's similar to other Southeast Asian countries and blended with them. So you'll find more similarities between Vietnam and Cambodia or Laos or Thailand. And um, the people are known as the Viets. And they were invaded by the Qin. Uh, that's the Qin dynasty of China. 
and conquered by the Han. And so let's take a look at some of the images. Um, we looked at the Red River already. Here is Vietnam on a world map. This is um, uh, this landmass is Asia. Um, they are known as the Austroasiatic rice farming people. And so this would be the hearth or the birthplace of Vietnamese culture. So let's talk about uh, social systems in Vietnamese. And so they lived, uh, the villages had autonomy. Autonomy is like independence. Uh, they're based on the nuclear family. Your nuclear family would be like mom, dad, brother, sister. They were not based on extended family like China. Remember, China had veneration or respect for grandparents, and so you would have several families living together in China. Um, some differences between v Vietnam and uh, China is women wore long skirts in Vietnam, while women in China wore black pants. Uh, women in Vietnam... Uh, uh, went to or, or saw, and not just uh, women, but also men, cockfighting, which is where uh, the roosters fight. They also chewed a beetle nut, which is from the beetle tree. Uh, it is a mild stimulant, and it is for me medicinal proper, uh, uh, purposes. And the beetle nut, if you look up here at the image, is right here. And what it does is it blackens teeth. And so the Chinese thought that the Vietnamese women were... Um, gross for doing that and there's a distinct literature and art and most Vietnamese people are Buddhist and so at the bottom image is the, the what a small typical village would look like today. China did not have the same relationship with Vietnam as it did with Japan and Korea. There is a lot of resistance on behalf of the Vietnamese people. However, they did pay tribute to China, um, usually by force. Han conquered them. Uh, they attended Chinese schools. There is a uh, rise of Confucianism. Um, Chinese farming techniques are adopted. Um, the Vietnamese also copied China's political and military system. The Vietnamese aristocracy, though, uh, never fully embraced Chinese imports the way uh, the upper class in Japan and Korea did. And uh, in turn, the Chinese did not care for Vietnamese culture as well. And so Vietnam uh, gained independence after the fall of, Ta of Tang in 939. And women did not like the male dominance of Confucianism because women in Vietnam are... Um, more independent than in other Asian countries. Okay, I have fixed the word there, so that is the Tang Dynasty. So let's talk about the continuing impact in Vietnam. Scholar gentries never enjoyed as much power as those in China. Local officials sided uh, with peasants rather than with Chinese um, officials. And there's a strong connection with Buddhist monastic orders uh, rather than with Chinese Confucianism. Uh, women are also held high in Buddhism, which was in opposition of Neo-Confucianism that was occurring at the time. The Viets also defeated the Chams, who were uh, originally natives of the island of Borneo in Indonesia, and they had migrated in the early 2nd century CE to Vietnam, and they lived in southeast Vietnam. And so looking at the map, South Vietnam is in this area. And so they speak a different language than uh, most of the Vietnamese. Uh, and in modern day times, they're also well, the higher population of Muslims in the area. The Khmers uh, were from Cambodia. And the Vietnamese saw the Chams and the Khmers as savages and because um, they were often referred to as uh, beasts. They were drove into the highlands uh, so that the Vietnamese could extend their kingdom to the south. And, but in doing so, there was a cultural convergence in the south. Vietnamese adopted charms and Khmer customs. And when France arrived in the early 19th century, the Viets were highly divided. And if you were to look at the map, you can see that there are many different language families, which means that there's many different cultures in Vietnam. And so this slide ends the lecture on China's influence. Let's look at some similarities between Japan, Korea, and Vietnam. Each region was fertile, uh, which allowed sedentary civilization. Sedentary means to stay in one place. Uh, they focused on wet rice crops. 
uh, they transported writing and bureaucratic organization. They all shared political organization, social development, and intellectual development. And so uh, the purpose of this lecture is to show you um, how influential China was in the uh, East Asian area um, during the period uh, from early history up until around the 19th century. The next lecture is on the Mongols.